you've mentioned in your notes on your website and on your Instagram that you studied documentary photography. What led you to the point of studying documentary photography and why did you want to study it? I mean, I've been into photography since I was a child. So um, it's kind of, I was looking to go on to do photography in some way um, at higher education and just did the usual thing really of looking at all the different degree courses. I'd, I'd done a BTEC, um, like two year general photography course prior to going to uni. Um, and just different things about the course appealed to me really. So it wasn't specifically that I wanted to study documentary photography, but I was looking for a course that kind of suited the, the type of work I enjoyed, which, um, which was sort of landscape photography, but in quite an objective way, I suppose. Um, so I, think I looked at a few different degree courses, Brighton, um, Westminster, Newport, uh, and a couple of others. And Newport just kind of seemed to fit really, um, from what I saw of it before going. So, so yeah. And then it, it just kind of, um, the course was pretty broad. So although it's documentary photography it is, you know, fairly broad. So the work that you, the work that you did could go down whatever route that you, you kind of wanted, but it was, it was documentary as opposed to just fine art photography, I suppose. Well, something I think that's really important for photographers, especially in the age of sort of social media or any creative for that matter, is that you curate the stuff that kind of comes across your social media feeds so that your social media feed becomes something that's inspiring. It's not something that kind of, uh, you know, I, I have to avoid political stuff because it just tends to wind me up and make me not want to work. So I have to remove anything that can be political, which is becoming harder and harder. <laughs> and I also, I'm really keen on having people that very much specialize in one area and you're the only person I have on my social media feeds that isn't that. And I don't, I, the thing is, I can't explain why, but I like all of the different genres that you cover. Okay. And not like in a way that I can enjoy whatever you're going to put up next, I'm going to enjoy it. It's not like I really enjoy one sort of facet of what you do and then I have to endure other sides of it, which if I was to put up multiple genres, other people would have to definitely endure what I was putting up because I'm definitely not talented enough to cover more than one genre. I guess really what's your sort of preferred subjects because you cover landscape, you photograph dogs, you do sort of English heritage stuff. What are your preferred subjects? And is there any sort of real difficulties in photographing that variety of subject for you? I mean, yeah, I totally hear what you're saying about a, a multitude of facets to the, the work that I show. Um, and that's, yeah, I guess I, I'm aware that that can put people off. Um, but I've, I suppose, try, I, yeah, I try as much as possible to, to tie things together with, um, a fairly consistent approach or style. So I definitely, uh, which comes back to the documentary background, I guess I, de I definitely try and, um, photograph in a way that's unobtrusive and kind of, um, more observing the subject, whether it's a, a person, dog, garden, uh, landscape, whatever, rather than, um, staging stuff or posing people. I'm hopeless at directing and posing and everything. So, um, really don't enjoy having to do that side of it. Um, so yeah, I guess the, the work that I do is wide ranging, but it's, it's probably held together by a, a sort of fairly consistent approach. Um, but in terms of subjects, yeah, it is wide ranging. So I, I do some of what I shoot is based on what, what a job, what, you know, the subject that needs to be covered for that job for that client. Um, so I shoot gardens, um, for, um, for businesses. So like garden designers, um, and locations and those kind of things. And some of it's also sort of editorial, garden magazines or stock photography, those kind of things. Um, and then, yeah, the dogs that's generally, um, for individuals rather than commercial work. Um, but again, I try and just do that in a, in a fairly laid back style. So I don't, I don't have a studio, so I'm not, I'm not sort of, um, lighting everything really carefully. Um, I'm not posing and using different backgrounds and everything. It's all just very much natural and, and out and about. So I think, yeah, the subjects vary, but the approach and the style is fairly consistent. 
In a sort of day and age where everyone's kind of chasing the cultural black hole that is kind of Western America, it's very mm-hmm. unusual, maybe purely from my own uh, sort of keyhole view of things, but it's very unusual for people to kind of be celebrating English heritage, old English, um, or I guess British is probably more accurate, but but old British aesthetics. Um, why? What draws you to that? And is there something about sort of uh, the history of Britain that you find quite personal to what you want to show in your photography? Good question. Um, I guess I've I've always liked the country that that I live in. Um, I'm not. I mean, I've I've travelled a bit, not not widely, but um, yeah, I've travelled a bit. I have been to America a couple of times, and I would certainly love to see more of more of it. And a lot of the photography I like does um, definitely sort of go back to that tradition, that sort of Western um, big landscapes and, you know, abandoned buildings and, and all the rest of it. And that does definitely appeal to me. Um, but I think, I think UK is, has got a lot to offer as well. Um, and yeah, I guess I've just visited lots of parts of the country. Family are spread out around the UK. Um, I grew up in Essex. So that was sort of one part of Britain. I, I always enjoyed going on holiday to the north. So I, I love the Lake District and Cumbria. And um, now I live in the southwest. I went to university in Wales. Uh, my wife's from the northeast. Um, so kind of, I guess I've, I've got a fairly good overview of, of the UK. Um, in terms of the heritage side of it, I mean, I used to, I did used to work for English Heritage. So um, I kind of handled and scanned and printed a lot of, the archive photography and and stuff there for a few years um so that that was sort of a, i guess a bit of an influence in in that area um but i was probably already interested in history and heritage before doing that as well so your um especially your images of gardens i always find your composition and um your use of depth of field um, and sort of the, it feels to me, I, I can't speak for you taking the picture, but it feels to me as the viewer that colour is definitely something that leads the, the compositional um, idea behind the image. It all seems to come from an almost painting, painterly background where it's sort of more influenced by non-photographic than photographic art. Is Are you a fan of other types of art or is it, am I just completely reading into something that isn't there? I mean, I'm a, a fan of all kind of landscape work so uh yeah painting um photography cinema um a whole lot really so uh, yeah color color is obviously a big element in in photographing gardens i mean i i really like black and white photography you know if you photograph in gardens certainly commercially or editorially then color has to kind of be one of the main aspects of that even though you might you might get away with throwing some black and white in there as well um, color does. And I think if you're photographing gardens that have been designed by garden designers or uh, then yeah, color will be part of their, their plan and approach to that. Um, so it, it plays a part in the composition. I think you just, when you're composing a picture, you, you're looking at the, the structure and the sort of architectural elements of it, but also color is something that can kind of guide your eye through the image. So yeah, it, it's easier often to kind of do that you know in a place that has been designed or planned with that in mind but but you just do do see it in nature as well so you know without without the design element that's something you can find and work with a bit of a broad question but you kind of already touched Mm -hmm. upon it so we might as well go there what type of clients hire a professional storyteller Mm, not many in my experience um (laughs) (laughs) you 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 probably um, get hired as a professional storyteller a lot more do, doing weddings um, than I do. I would I would like to be hired as a professional storyteller more, but I, th- I think a lot of the time people are looking more to uh, certainly with the, the sort of areas that I find myself photographing. People are often looking more to represent their brand or whatever, which you know there could be an element of story in that, but. Um, yeah, I don't actually get many, many paid jobs that are pure storytelling photography. Um, but, but that's, uh, yeah, they probably, I should go back to doing wedding photography or whatever if I, if I want to do that. Uh, I, I, I've tried my hand at sort of 
documentary family photography a fair bit as well. Um, although I don't do so much of that now. Um, and I think just a lot of things there's, there's maybe not the demand for in the UK in the way there is in the States or in other, in other parts of the world. Um, so, so yeah, in my experience, not, not loads. Your images of dogs are actually what drew me in. First of all, I'm a, I'm a very proud dog owner myself, and I know you are. Photographing dogs is something that I've always thought about doing because I have an absolute love for um, dogs themselves. One thing I think is I would I would struggle massively with the distraction element personally. But when it comes to photographing dogs, how how difficult is it in terms of controlling behaviour and satisfying kind of the the personality of the owner as much as it is the dog? Is it a difficult job? Uh-huh. Controlling the behaviour. Um, you're talking to someone who was just pulled over while out running with his dog this morning uh, when he saw a cat. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, ended up flat on my face on the street with my dog running off 100 yards down the road chasing a cat. So, oh dear. Controlling, controlling the behaviour, not necessarily my strong point. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I always have the owner there as well. Um, and I tend to just try and photograph them in a fairly natural way, like I said. So if, you know, they, they will behave how they behave and I'll try and capture them as best I can during that time. So I always need to allow plenty of time for whatever photography I'm doing, whether it's, uh, animals, families, uh, landscapes, gardens, whatever. Um, because you are subject to conditions, subject to people, and animal behavior and everything. So if you, if you attempt to do something in a short space of time, then, um, certainly for me anyway, it just ends up being stressful and I can't really be creative. But, um, if I'm with someone and their dog and we're out for a walk and you chat in, then you're not sort of shooting the whole time. You, you can, um, spend some time chatting with the owner uh, the dog can be obviously being exercised as far as the dog's concerned. They're just out for a walk. So they're not really doing anything differently. Although i still, if, if they're able to, I'll still get the owner to, um, sort of maybe get them to sit and look at the camera if possible at some point. But, uh, but yeah, most of the time they're just, they're just doing what they would do. And I'm kind of lurking somewhere, um, close, close by snapping away. Um, but yeah, we just try and include locations and, and elements and, and stuff that are going to hopefully make for good pictures. So you said you started off in life in Essex and you're now based in Mm -hmm. Bristol. How much has relocating to Bristol kind of shaped your photography from everywhere else you've been? Um, Bristol's very varied place, very diverse. I mean, where I, I grew up in Southeast Essex, um, so sort of London commuter belt type town. Um, and yeah, probably a bit more middle class, um, than, than where I am now. Now I live in obviously, yeah, Bristol's kind of got everything really. So I'm in, on the edge of Bristol, suburban sprawl kind of on the Northeast edge going into South Gloucestershire. Um, so I'm not living in the city centre, but the city is fairly easily accessible. Um, and yeah, it's just a really varied place. Lots of interesting bits to photograph, lots of kind of historic landscapes with all the docks and the harbour side and everything. But it's also quite a hilly place. So you get, you know, there's quite a variety of of landscape in that sense. Um, but it's a green city as well. So there's lots of parks and gardens and kind of open spaces. So yeah, it's kind of got a bit of everything, but as I say, I'm kind of on the edge and I, I definitely feel like I'm more of a, a rural inclined person than a, than a city person. So if anything, I tend to try and go in the opposite direction than the city and, and head out, um, you know, whenever I can, but, but yeah, it's it's a it's a nice place. It's it's just got a lot of variety. You are an educator as well as just being a photographer in your own right. Um, you do workshops and tuition. What do you teach, mm-hmm. and who are who are the people that are generally contacting you for tuition? The workshops that I do tend to be fairly varied, although at the moment that's that's not taking place for obvious reasons. Um, I've done workshops on the kind of things that I shoot commercially or professionally anyway. So 
uh, garden photography, um, family photography. I've, I've done talks to sort of photography groups on just sort of general aspects of work, like, um, the process of shooting on location, for example, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, fa- fairly broad, fairly varied. And I want also, um, Lightroom. I've taught a bit sort of on cataloging work and processing images in Lightroom. Um, so yeah, a range of stuff really, but all, all linked in with whatever I have experienced shooting. And is it like university students or college students coming to you for kind of additional help with what they're doing? Or is it people that are just starting out in their photographic journey? It tends to be more, um, just sort of amateur photographers or keen amateurs, semi-professionals looking to, um, develop their skills a bit more or enjoy photography as a hobby. So, um, yeah, not people who are studying it formally. You promote the benefits of photography for well-being, and I kind of want to give you the floor on just explaining what that is and how you go about it. <laughs> it's it's kind of a work in progress, really. So how I go about it isn't, um, yeah, might be a, a bit of a step ahead at the moment. Um, my health has been fairly sporadic, I guess, over the years um, with sort of ongoing not nothing sort of major, but I uh, have ME, um, CFS ME, which means that um, I have to kind of plan a lot of the work and activity that I do because if I take on too much, my my health is affected and and I basically get ill quite easily. Or so so yeah, I've basically found that photography can be. Um, a very good way to kind of ground me and and help me to I guess focus on what's around me and just just kind of appreciate that but um, in the same way that anyone who goes out kind of you know for a walk in the woods or whatever to 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 kind of slow down and and help their physical mental well-being or whatever I just um, you know I'm not I'm not alone in the fact that doing that along with something creative um, can be really beneficial. So it's my aim to kind of share that with other people, um, uh, possibly through kind of not workshops, that's a bit formal, but, but sort of one-to-one or, or group settings. Uh, I'm also trying to do some writing about that as well, um, to combine photography and my approach to photography with thoughts on how it, that can be beneficial for physical, mental, health well-being um and yeah lots of people have kind of approached me and, and it said that they've had similar experiences whether it's grief um or just um helping them through uh mental health issues depression anxiety whatever it is so so yeah but it's, it's more of a more of an aim and a, and a work in progress than something i'm already excelling at i guess something i've learned from doing these podcasts and spending the last about seven and a half years of my life in photography is that uh, sometimes the online aspect, especially the kind of unsolicited feedback aspect can lead to uh, less positive and more negative in terms of generally speaking, people behave very differently online than they do in person. They can be quite cruel. They can be quite horrible. What's the secret to kind of being a photographer in the age of social media and still making it an overall positive experience? Ooh. Good question. Um, I tend to s- stay away from Facebook, um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I, I use Instagram, but I don't. I wouldn't say I kind of get massively involved in social media. I use Instagram to to share work normally, daily or uh, certainly regularly, and I look at other people's photography and enjoy other people's work. But I don't necessarily. Um, I don't know if I get drawn into social media too much or at least I try not to um certainly I know that yeah if you if you engage in it um in a certain way then the end yeah, it would be hugely negative um there is the kind of comparative thing of where you know you see other other people's work and other people's successes and you need to be careful I guess that that that's not that that uh kind of motivates you and influences you in a positive way, but we, you know, without you thinking, oh, why are they doing that? And I'm not kind of thing. 
Um, but yeah, I think I think Instagram on the whole is you know can can be a really positive experience. Um, but like you said a little while ago, you do need to sort of curate your feed in a sense to <laughs> to um, yeah. look at stuff that's going to be helpful and and not um, not unhelpful. As someone that's been formally educated in photography in an age where I think more and more people aren't um, who Mm -hmm. are working in the business, how much of a benefit do you think it is at this point to be going through the sort of the university system or the the college system to learn photography compared to just trying to sort of fight your way through the information that you find online? I actually don't know that much about the formal photography education system at this time. Um, Obviously, I've I went through it a long time ago. So it was back in the late nineties for me. Um, and it's obviously going to have changed a lot since then, but I guess that the, the people teaching the the subjects are going to probably have come from a time before all the, the onslaught of the sort of YouTube and everything like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, when I when I studied at Newport, it was it was kind of just before digital, so um, film was all there was. Uh, processing always took place in the dark rooms, and and that was kind of all there was. So the, the yeah, there wasn't this massive thing of comparing equipment and comparing uh, the latest whatever because nothing, everything was much slower in terms of progression, but since digital, it's really, really, you know, the ramped up cameras, superseding cameras and people, um, sort of examining every pixel and comparing different lenses and all that, that kind of didn't really happen when I was studying photography. So whether that has kind of fed into the sort of formal education of it now, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not that heavily involved in that side of it. So you started off, like you just said, um, in a dark room, essentially at college, you were working with film. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you're now digital. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you still do any film or do you, do you strictly now do, um, digital and how was that? How was the changeover? Was it a smooth transition? Yeah. I mean, I haven't shot film for ages, but I, I still really love film and I would like kind of give it a go at some point but I, I think just it's not commercially viable um yeah the process for me if I was to shoot film for for professional work would just yeah as I say it just wouldn't be commercially viable um I would like to to shoot some film again um but I think whenever I've looked into it it's quite expensive so um by the time you look at obviously you've got the cost of the film processing and then these days to really do anything with the images outside of a dark room. They need to be scanned. Um, and then you kind of work in with the digital file again. So for me, um, if I was, yeah, I'd have to have a reason to shoot film. And I think I would probably still end up with, as I say, a digital scan that I was then probably tweaking in some way in Lightroom or Photoshop anyway, which is, I think if when I shot film originally, obviously there was no digital side to it. So your, your process was shoot the film, develop the film, print in the darkroom and the the print was the end result. Um, and that's, uh, probably not how it would take place now without a massive investment. Um, in terms of transition, I just kind of probably drifted into digital really. So I was shooting film, um, through the nineties and into the two thousands. And I think I got my first digital camera in 2003, but that's not some, it's probably not, not a camera that I would have used professionally. That would be more for home family type shots. Um, so I was still shooting medium format at that time. And then my first digital SLR camera was probably a back in 2005, six, something like that. Uh, good old Canon 10D or uh, whatever. Yeah, around about that time that would have been. And then I've just stuck stuck with Canon digital cameras since then um, and haven't really shot film since. But yeah, would be, I've still got um, a couple of old film, 
well, say a couple of film cameras. Um, so in theory, could could shoot film if I could find somewhere to process it and scan it for an affordable cost. I mean, not with that irony, I'm aware of the, the contradiction in asking you um, about, you know, well, you, you've basically mentioned about how it's become a bit of an arms race um, with t- with res- mm-hmm. sort of regard to the photographic gear superseding itself constantly. Yeah. And I think a lot of photographers that I speak to understand the gear has very little to do with anything. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, if, if the person holding the camera doesn't know what they're doing or what they're trying to create or the message that they're trying to put across, no matter how many megapixels you have or how many uh, focus points you have, you're not going to be able to translate that message. The camera still needs the squishy bit behind it to actually be relatively competent. Uh, with yeah, all of yeah. that said, I, I have to ask you what you're using in terms of, of camera gear at the moment, what lenses you're using, what's your favorite go-to stuff? Yeah, yeah. So still, still with Canon. Not, I'm not really um, biased towards Canon over Nikon or Fuji or Sony or anyone else. It's just, um, as you know, when you kind of invested in a system, you tend to have to have a good reason to to move away from it. Um, mm-hmm. So I've I've kind of yeah, Canon was the the first digital SLR I had, and there have been times when I've thought about drifting away from it onto something else. Um, but at the moment. I use an EOS R for probably the majority of stuff. Um, so that's a mirrorless, um, mirrorless Canon full frame with a digital viewfinder, and also a 5D Mark IV. Um, so I usually have, I usually have two bodies on the go and kind of um, upgrade one, you know, every few years or whatever. And that becomes the main one, and then the other's more of a backup. Um, but I also do quite like working with two bodies as well, because it just means I can change lenses less and just sort of spreads things out a bit. Uh, so yeah, the five D four and EOS R are the, the two bodies. And lens wise, um, do like using a fifty mil as much as possible. Um, so yeah, the the Canon fifty one point two is probably my kind of workhorse on the on the camera as much as possible um 35 one four another definite favorite i've got the original the older one rather than the mark ii that they brought out a few years ago um so yeah still really like that lens um i use 100 mil macro a fair bit especially doing garden work 70 to 200, um, just a workhorse for, especially doing like dog photography, any fast moving subjects, action stuff, but also, yes, just really, really versatile lens. Um, and, uh, yeah, I use a 24 to 70 as well. I, t- I tend to, I tend to like prime lenses, um, as much as possible, but zoom lenses can often give a bit of, versatility so some locations um, it might be i might be restricted on where i can be might not be able to move about necessarily as close to something or as far away as from something as i want to so zoom lenses in those kind of situations are good um but yeah i you know i do i do enjoy using primes i think it's just the more the more simple you can make it the better um but but yeah zoom lenses do have their place as well how do you find balancing um, switching between mirrorless and SLR? Because I've mm-hmm. I've switched to mirrorless in the last year, and it's taken me a long time to get used to not having an optical viewfinder. And I can't imagine now if I was to switch between the two, my brain would be able to handle that particularly well. Yeah, it's it's harder than I thought it would be actually. So I think that's why I've ended up now using shooting with the EOS R the majority of the time. I think when I when I got it, because uh, I did, I was using a 5D3 and a 5D4 sort of simultaneously. Um, so I traded in the 5D3 for the OSR, kept the 5D4, and I thought I'd just use them both in the same way. Um, but like you said, you, I think I probably underestimated at the time how different it is using a digital viewfinder. Um, and I really like it and have got used to it. And... And I shoot quite differently, I think, with a digital viewfinder, even in terms of just kind of camera settings and, and stuff, just because you can see, obviously, your exposure 
uh, prize taking the picture, it it does make a huge difference. So now, yeah, you're right. I find when I'm using them both together, um, it's a it's not that straightforward. But I tend to set the 5D Mark IV up a bit differently to how I set up the OSR and um, try and just remind myself that what I'm seeing through the viewfinder on the on the Mark IV isn't what I'm going to get necessarily, and so I need to check the back of the camera frequently because yeah, you can you can forget you you think you're looking at a digital viewfinder and shoot away and then realise that your exposure might be off. So yeah, do I have to it's a bit of a mental thing whether I'll um, get another digital viewfinder sort of mirrorless camera to replace the Mark IV I don't know but at the moment the autofocus in the Mark IV is is better for for the sort of moving subjects that I do so oh, okay we'll, we'll see where it goes <laughs> you mentioned that you used to shoot weddings and that you moved away from it what was it that sort of <laughs> sort of ended that for you uh, it's kind of my health, really. Um, obviously, weddings you're you're a uh, pretty important part of the day, and so I I used to shoot them my, on my own. I didn't have a second shooter or or anything like that. So um, you kind of really need to know that you're you're going to be uh, up to the job on the day. Um, and so yeah, just because my my health was a bit unreliable for a while, it's a lot better now. So I I I am actually probably likely to be shooting one or two over the next couple of years, but just through friends or friends of friends or whatever. So um, not that that makes it any less important or, or any less kind of crucial that you do a good job, but yeah, I'm, I'm a lot better place to do it now than probably a few years ago. Um, so, so yeah, it was, but um, I think when I started doing them, it was still quite traditional and that, that style of photography doesn't appeal to me, but over time you were able to, you know, especially with the, the, the sort of digital coming in, it was a lot easier to do them in a documentary style. And so, so I think now I, yeah, I could probably enjoy wedding photography a bit more again. Um, you don't have to change film every 10 photos. <laughs> um, as someone that covers so many different, uh, I guess, subgenres of photography within your overall uh, documentary style, where do you draw influence from? Are there photographers that are a big influence to you right now? Over time, I think, well, going back, um, I, I was definitely influenced by lots of the sort of objective landscape photographers, new topographic type photographers from the, through the 70s and 80s. Um, and then especially people like Andreas Gursky and Thomas Struth, um, just any, anyone that was doing like kind of very large format, um, landscapes or stuff where everything was really lined up and really kind of precise. Um, but then in the UK, I think landscape photographers like Jem Southern, um, photographing sort of rivers and, woodland in a very sort of natural way I liked. Um, now I like um, Robert Darch. Um, I don't know if, you've, if you look him up on Instagram. Um, mm-hmm. Very documentary landscape um, people, but within the landscape quite, I suppose people would say sort of dark, moody work, but, but just nice and natural looking to me. Um, so yeah, I really like him. Um, and then just influences probably just things that I see. So in films or television or whatever, certain, certain things will appeal to me. So it doesn't have, not necessarily always still photography, but you know, just good cinematography, um, can, can really teach you a lot about light and composition. Um, so yeah, try and sort of not like watch loads of films, but, um, uh, probably the most recent thing I've seen at the cinema was because we can't go anymore. Um, Nineteen seventeen. Oh, so um, good. So anything, yeah, anything shot by Roger Deakin, I can sort of watch. Even if I'm not really, I mean, that was a great film. But even if I'm not particularly interested in the plot, I could still watch films that he's shot just for the cinematography. Because yeah, uh, I do. I like anything with those wide open spaces. 
I'm, I'm always surprised by photographers um, when I talk to them and they're not influenced by movies. I think we're right now mm-hmm. we're in a bit, a bit of a golden age. Sometimes it's, you know, I think we only, as human beings, we only tend to realise how good something is once we've kind of moved past it. But I really do feel like it, since about 2018 and we're still in the middle of it, so I don't know how much longer it will last, but we are in a real golden age of cinema where there, if you can sort of sweep aside some of the CGI nonsense that's constantly yep. breaking uh, box office numbers, there's actually mm-hmm. just an unbelievable amount of incredibly well made great there's just an abundance of great directors and abundance of great cinematographers and i really do feel like it's strange that photographers don't draw more influence from from cinema sure yeah yeah um although i mean it could be that they do and they maybe just don't realize it um because yeah a lot of the composition styles and stuff that you see in team photography obviously exist in cinema um but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm aware that they're very, very different, um, formats to work in. And if I, I mean, I've tried, I've dabbled a little bit in bits of video, but it is a completely different discipline. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't certainly don't think that if you're a photographer, you'd be a good videographer or vice versa, but you're definitely right that there's a, a lot of photographers can learn from good cinematography. Um, yeah, definitely. The last thing I'm going to ask you, and I really do appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today, is just essentially, is there, is there anywhere in, in England or Scotland or Wales or anywhere on the, on the British Isles that you have wanted to photograph but haven't yet had the opportunity and that you're really excited to, to finally get that opportunity? Oh, good question. Um, well, as I said, I love the Lake District, so I've, I've, I wouldn't say I've exhausted it. I've, there's still lots of that that I would love to photograph, even though it's a, a small place, there's still plenty to explore. Um, I like a lot of the, I suppose, fairly bleak type landscapes in the UK. Um, so yeah, there's always more to discover. Uh, An area I'd love to go to that I haven't photographed would be down, um, on the South coast at Dungeness around, around there where it's very bleak and the, uh, the garden that was, um, used to belong to Derek Jarman, the film producer guy. Um, and yeah, he had a, a garden down there with a little shack and right by the, the bleak sort of, um, yeah, kind of on the flat coastal landscape. And so, yeah, I, that, that would suit me because it would combine kind of garden photography and landscape and everything all at the same time. Um, with quite a, quite a documentary bleak kind of feel to it. I'm actually going to ask one more question because first of all, I'm a liar apparently, but also because you're, you're so inherent, you have such an inherent sort of British edge to your work. If you were kind of banned from living in, in Britain, yeah. where would you want to live? Ooh, good question. Um, that's yeah, really hard. I, I haven't probably traveled enough to be able to answer that, but, um, parts of the States possibly, although. I think it would, um, there'd be lots of aspects of the US that maybe wouldn't appeal to me, but um, certainly parts of it would for the landscape and the places. Yeah, I don't know. I'd, maybe someone like Denmark or <laughs> probably really sort of the, the, the bleak kind of Scandinavian. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question, but some, somewhere with a fairly similar climate, I suppose. So not. <laughs> not not too similar maybe a bit warmer than, than the UK might be good <laughs> uh, but yeah I don't know part, parts of France or Italy or or whatever where you know you can get a bit of mild dry weather most of the year but not be baked yeah but somewhere with good landscape definitely like I say, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Um, what we always mm. do at the end of these is make sure that people know where they can find your work online. So if you could just give us your social media and your websites and whatnot. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, my website is just andrewmaybury.co.uk. Uh, Maybury is spelled M-A-Y-B-U-R-Y. And on Instagram, I'm just Andrew Maybury. Uh, no underscores or anything. 
Um, yeah, they're the, the two main places. Yeah. And you have presets available also on your website. Um, so oh, I do, make yes. sure, yeah. want to make sure that people know they can go there if they want to, cause you have a wonderful color palette to your work as well. So it's obviously mm-hmm. a very helpful starting point for anybody. Yeah. If people enjoy using Lightroom, then at the moment they're just desktop ones. They're not mobile friendly, unfortunately, but, um, yeah, yeah, they're there and downloadable along with various other, other stuff. Yeah. So it's been such a pleasure to talk to you. I've been a fan of yours for quite a while. I was actually kind of sort of uh, scrolling back through your work then. I didn't realize quite how long I'd been following you. So uh, it's, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. Brilliant. No, it's been great to talk to you. And yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me.